Lady Jane Grey has rarely been a character in her own right. When you have a historical figure who is so powerless and the contemporary view of her was so obscure, there have been efforts to make Jane into more of a well-rounded character. If there's one constant in all these media types it's that Jane is always a constant victim, being manipulated by her family, by Northumberland, by everyone. How many times can you put a new spin on a tragedy? Let's find out. For this list I'm also going to lightly touch on the portrayals of Jane's parents, Northumberland and Guildford, as they are so well associated with Jane there is pretty much no point in making them a list on their own, so we will talk about that and we'll probably go into more depth in it when we get to part 3. Or in this case part 4, because we had the other bit, didn't we? <laughs> Let's go! Life itself is only a vision, a dream. Nothing exists save empty space and you. And you are but a thought. There are a lot of adaptations of Mark Twain's Prince and the Pauper. I have watched practically every single one that was set in the Tudor era, and I still think the Barbie version is the best one. But that's not for here. Maybe in the future we can do a hot takes about the Prince and the Pauper thing. So six of these adaptations take place in the Tudor era and involve Lady Jane Grey in some capacity. Unfortunately there is one that is Portuguese and I could not find it anywhere so we'll just have to leave that one. What you should know about the Prince and the Pauper adaptations is that they somewhat share the same storyline as the book but they always go off and do their own thing. There's always the same mistaken identity crisis and it almost always ends at the coronation with Edward managing to prove himself as the true king just in time. In the novel Lady Jane Grey is just a background character so it's up to the adaptations to fill out the space, if they can be bothered. In the 1936 film starring Errol Flynn, Jane is portrayed by Anne Howard and only appears in one scene at the beginning. The next adaptation, made by Disney in 1962, has her played by Jane Asher. Here she is given more lines and referred to by Edward as his favourite playmate, since she is much closer in age to him than his sisters. However, she disappears from the narrative not long after she first appears, as a large chunk of the film is dedicated to Edward going on adventures with Zorro. The thing with Prince and the Pauper is that a lot of the story is dedicated to Edward experiencing life outside of the palace and seeing how the people are mistreated. As such, the adaptations decide to add an element of corruption and plotting into the Tudor court in order to rack up tension and make it all the more important for Edward to claim back his crown. Jane has a slightly larger role in the 1990s miniseries that was made by Julian Fellows, where she is someone for Elizabeth to talk to while she is trying to figure out what is wrong with her brother. In the 1977 film, otherwise known as Cross Swords, things are a lot hornier and much more inaccurate. In this version, Edward and Jane are aged up significantly, as well as our pauper Tom Canty. So, while Tom is in Edward's place, he has a crush on Jane and they start making out, much to Elizabeth's disapproval, but she states later that she'd rather be a queen than marry a pauper. So after the big reveal, she marries an old duke for his money, but Tom climbs her balcony every night. So I guess in this universe, Jane was never used as a pawn by her family and never reigned for nine days. She managed to escape. Good for her. Other than that, Jane doesn't have much of a significant role to play in The Prince and the Pauper, but on the bright side, at least she gets acknowledgement. Ignoring her would probably have been very easy to do. If only the BBC coverage of the Tudor era from the 1970s had gone further when showing Edward VI and Mary I reigns. These 11 years are squeezed into the first episode, and while we do have an hour and a half to tell the story, the narrative revolves primarily around Elizabeth, so Lady Jane Grey has a mere 10 seconds of screen time and zero lines. Immediately after Thomas Seymour is executed, we jump straight ahead to 1553 where Edward is on his deathbed. Cranmer is by his bedside, while Northumberland stands nearby with Guilford Dudley and Jane on either side of him. As Edward takes his final breath, and Cranmer takes the young king's hand, Jane sobs into Northumberland's shoulder, while he braces his son for what's to come. Of course, as we know, Jane was not there when Edward died, but her inclusion here while probably narrative shorthand, does make me wonder if, had they managed to expand on this, 
would they have made Jane complicit in stealing Mary's throne? Guess we'll never know. Following Edward's death, we have a scene where William Cecil rides with all haste to Mary to warn her about the coup. We don't see Mary taking back the throne and instead jump forward to the conspirators against her being locked in the tower. Each of them has a different reaction to finding themselves in different circumstances. Northumberland is figuratively and literally backed up against the wall. Guildford turns away angrily to look through the bars on his window. Cranmer is despondent as he surveys the cell's interior, clearly contemplating if he should recant to escape or reiterate his faith, remain in the cell and be burned. Meanwhile, Jane, while first having her back to the jailer and by extension the viewer, puts her hand on her neck, foreshadowing her fate. This is all we see of Jane. Her execution is referenced when Elizabeth herself is brought to the tower, as her scaffold remains standing on Tower Green, giving Elizabeth the feeling that the scaffold will be used for her. It's nice that Jane was at least referenced and her fate was an ominous reminder that Mary was capable of executing family members. So Elizabeth had good reason to fear her sister. I just wish this part of the Tudor era, which is often ignored as much as Henry VII's reign, was shown more. Are you Protestant? Are you vaguely related to Henry VIII? Is your name Lady Jane Grey? Then you won our star prize and you're going to experience what it's like to be queen for nine days. Wow. It's been a while since Horrible Histories featured its own segment on my list, and not an amusing reference that the British part of my audience appreciates. This sketch summarises Jane's nine-day rule in a humorous manner. The show is all about the black comedy. Jane has won a Queen for Nine Days competition and gets experience in the luxurious benefits of being Queen, like living in the royal apartments of the Tower of London, getting a crown and having a coronation. Okay, what harm can it do? <laughs> You'll find that out on day nine. Sorry? Nothing. Jane spends the first half of the sketch enjoying her new lifestyle, not realising the gravity of the situation until the narrator says, Day six, relax and take in the luxurious surroundings while Mary Tudor amasses an army to have you removed from power. What? The best part is that the narrator never changes his tone of voice, even when Jane is on her way to the execution block. I never wanted to be queen in the first place. With queen for nine days, the shortest reign in history is yours, whether you want it or not. Overall, there's nothing really inaccurate to be found here, just exaggerations. But it is very short and over the top, so it's hard to place it anywhere else. Warning, limited to nine days only, often expires in 1553. <laughs> This is purely a fan-made portrayal of Lady Jane Grey. So great was the popularity of Six the Musical that artistic fans have created personas surrounding the other figures from the Tudor era, and even some outside of the Tudor era, giving them their own costume design and a pop song to best represent their personality and the story they tell. Shout out to RTE who created the Lady Jane Grey persona and has done a few animatics and their designs have sort of contributed to the whole Six the Kids spin-off. Lady Jane Grey's song is Teen Idol by Marina and the Diamonds. Turns out this song actually came out on my 17th birthday. Pretty cool. The song has themes of regret surrounding a teenage life, where they wish they'd had the glamorous life of a teenager who was a pop idol. The sort of teenage life that's fed to a lot of teenagers today through social media outlets. But even before social media there was also magazines and television, all that sort of stuff, telling you how you should live your life and what standards were acceptable. But of course those hide all the downsides to it, like eating disorders and depression and other mental problems, unless of course they're trying to glorify it through the tabloids, which is also a bad thing. Over the course of the animatic there is a portrayal of how Jane's life plays out through her forced marriage, her brief reign and her eventual execution. There are short flashes that show her being controlled by strings, red strings to indicate blood, showing that she was always someone's puppet. At the end of the song, just as the act swings, we cut to Jane in her sixth persona, surrounded by the other six, the kids' personas. The costume design in and of itself is simplistic, but it does sort of match Jane's personality. It's a grey or silver leotard with a matching headband and long braids to indicate her youth. I think I would like to sort of draw my own version of a Six the Kids 
Hang on a sec, where's my sketchbook? So this is my original sketch of it. It's um, I used the reference from Marina and the Diamonds because I thought, why not? She does the song. And I think I would like to do sort of six the musical designs for any of the kings and queens that I cover. Mostly the queens. RTE and other people have like done designs for George Boleyn and Robert Dudley and they're quite interesting and also Edward VI. So you see my Elizabeth of York design. But um, here we go. Bear with me. So I've done one for Elizabeth Woodville that was sort of based on Labour by Paris Paloma. If you don't know what Labour by Paris Paloma is, look it up, it's a really good song. And later down the line for the Mary Queen of Scots rankings, I want to do one for Mary and her four Marys, so I would call it Mary to the power of five. And this is like just one of the designs i got so far, so that's Mary Beaton, Mary Fleming, Mary Livingston, and this is kind of like the preliminary sketch for Mary Seaton, but I might change that. But yeah, obviously I'm sort of basing those costume designs from the costumes in rain because, well, they've got to be there for a reason, right? And I might design the four Marys around the designs from rain. It'd see how far I go with it. Yes, Mary Queen of Scots does have her own Six the Kids spin-off, so go and have a look at that. Her animatic's also pretty good. This is the only opera I've managed to find on Lady Jane Grey that has music and a libretto and, to an extent, a little bit of footage for me to use. As I said back in the Lost Media of Lady Jane Grey video, others have tried but have slipped into obscurity. But it seems changing the title has allowed the Chronicle of Nine to escape the fate of its predecessors. Slightly. A little bit. Unfortunately. Mm. This English language opera was written by Arnold Rosner, one of three he composed in his lifetime. Unfortunately, Rosner was not a very successful composer. He was self-taught, so he didn't have the clout of being classically trained, but he was very ambitious to see this opera have a release. Sadly, although the score and libretto were written in 1984, it did not receive a premiere until February 2020, seven years after his death, and just weeks before all the theatres in all the world were closed down because of this. Yeah, it's official. Lady Jane Grey operas are cursed. Donizetti dodged a bullet. On the bright side, the music is really good. Arnold Rosner used a mix of classical music, but also hints of Renaissance tones. So the prologue has a guy on the lute going, my chronicle, my chronicle of nine. Obviously I can't play it for YouTube reasons, but you can find the score on YouTube and on Amazon Music and Spotify, so go and find it and give it a listen. I encourage people to try and find things out for themselves. So some of the music actually sounds as if it was written in the 16th century and it's being sung to the style of 16th century music and that's something I lap up. Jane is played by, let me read this, Megan Pachicano. Megan, pa Megan Pachicano. If I uh, mispronounce that, I'm sorry. She's a soprano and a Sondheim fan, or at least that's what her Twitter bio says. She has a powerful and memorable voice, which is evident from her first scene, as you hear her resistance to having to marry Guildford Dudley. Very surprised to see Mary the First was the contralto in this. You'd think she'd be the mezzo at least. I must say, I don't know very much about music theory. I have an unfortunate past with every arts subject that I studied at school. We don't want to think about that. I go into a bad place, we don't want to think about that. So everything I've learned about the arts is through working in the arts or self-teaching. I would like to see this opera performed one day just so I can see it in its full form and I can make the decision for myself whether it deserves to be forgotten or not. Because I think at this stage, it is emblematic of all the other Lady Jane Grey operas that have been lost to time and the one opera whose libretto I found but music has gone missing. I'm not saying it needs to be put on at the Met and then beamed out for people to watch all across the globe. Because some operas probably don't really need that. 
The Hours needed that, that was really good opera by the way. If you can find a pro shot of The Hours opera, go and find it, so good. There are smaller opera companies in the world that I'm sure would love to take this on, like Opera North. Why don't you let Opera North take this on? I'm sure they can do something with it. Give the score a listen and let me know what you think. I think it's worth at least one full run. If there's a theatre director out there who could make it work, why not give it a chance? It was an unfortunate occurrence. An accident. You see, you see, what happened was... <laughs> so, uh... Should I defend myself, or should I just walk in the direction of the angry mob? Look, this is a good movie, and for a long time it's been considered the definitive version of Lady Jane Grey, and the turbulent time of the mid-Tudor era. Trevor Nunn is a legendary director, and I know this, I've seen it firsthand. I watched the Parent Trap musical. Yeah, if you didn't know there's the Parent Trap musical, it exists. Trevor Nunn directed it, I've seen it, it's pretty good. But Helena Bonham Carter is the weakest element of this movie. She does not fit this role at all. Everyone works fine with theirs, especially Patrick Stewart, but I can't stand the parts where she has to be sad. I understand this was at the very start of her career. Many actors start out in films where they don't really seem to fit, but they'll soon find the one role that takes off and they're better known for other things. And then when we look back, we realise Oh my god, that was them before they were famous. <gasps> you ever seen Amy Adams in Buffy? Or look at Pedro Pascal. Today he is everyone's favourite fantasy dilf, but before he was known as that, before he had his head crushed in by the mountain, he was a red shirt on Buffy. And I'm serious, like, he should have been a main character. There was an injustice done to us by robbing Buffy of Pedro Pascal. We shall be avenged. This is not the first film I've seen from the start of HBC's career. She did quite a few of those E.M. Forster movies that came out in the 80s and 90s, and she stood out like a sore thumb there as well. Funny thing is, I know she can do a role similar to this, someone who wanted so much out of life and had that taken from them. Case in point, Corpse Bride. I was a bride. My dreams were taken from me. No, I've stolen them from someone else. I love you, Victor. But you're not mine. There are points when she does sort of fit Jane's shy nature, when she's talking to practically anyone except her nanny, Ellen. Once she's shared a few minutes with someone, she comes into her own, and shows that she's intelligent and comfortable with having religious debates. Now this film is also a love story between Jane and Guilford Dudley, played by baby-faced Kerry Elways a year before Princess Bride. Guilford starts out as a drunk and a gambler, the stark opposite of Jane, and is just as reluctant to marry as her. He is pretty cynical because he's being used by his father and sees the world around him as so depressing and unchangeable that he drinks through it. Why don't you go to court, become a secretary or counsellor? Do something about all the things because you said! Because there isn't any point! Because it wouldn't work. It never does. Dear God and all his saints, what am I doing here? So, pretty much a zillennial. The manifestation of Guildford's frustration is in seeing the vagrants who live outside the country estate. Said estate used to be a monastery that was converted into a private house, and the people who previously worked that land are now starving, unemployed, and branded for begging. What's more, the worth of the money they can get isn't worth as much as it used to be. Jane, only just learning this, is upset from hearing it, and the tactless way Guildford says it. He sobers up and realises he's been a jackass, so he apologises to her, and they fall for each other. We get a montage of them being in love, but the reality of their situation comes back to haunt them when Jane catches some vagrants stealing from them, but lets them go. Both are aware that Northumberland is trying to use them, one of the best scenes is where Jane has completely come out of her shell, and she and Guilford jokingly pretend how they'd run things if they were in charge. They want to make a socialist utopia. Almost foreboding, seeing as this is Robin Hood saying this. Then, when Jane becomes queen, both her parents and Northumberland think that Jane can be manipulated, but her newfound confidence makes her and Guilford assert more dominance. However, because Jane and Guilford are still kids and are still naive, 
they make some bad decisions, like snubbing the Spanish ambassador. And when Mary is on her way to London and the Privy Council debate what to do, Northumberland suggests sending Suffolk to meet her. This might have been a success. However, Guildford had another idea. I told you my father was an honest man. Yes. So? So why not let him prove it? Send him to defend your throne. Shut up, Wesley! Sadly, once Jane is no longer queen and gets locked up, the confidence she gained is lost. Either Jane was only confident because she was dependent on Guildford, ugh, or we have just gone back on her character arc. Every time she cries, which is a lot in this part of the movie, by the way, it feels very fake and exaggerated. It's weird to see HBC struggle with basic human emotion in this, when we all know that the most extreme of emotions come easily to her. In the scene where she's being confronted by Mary, all I'm thinking is, things are the wrong way around. HBC should be playing Mary. I know she's a little too young to play at that time, but maybe we should have waited. Maybe this movie came out a little too soon. Maybe someone else should have played Jane. And HBC, having gone through her villain sense, would have been perfect as Mary the First. Yes, villain sense. That's a word I've come up with in the wake of House of the Dragon and to a lesser extent Morbius and Last Night in Soho, where we all know Matt Smith got famous from playing the Doctor and now he's playing villains or villainous characters. And so I came up with the word villain sense as a descriptor for actors who started out playing famous heroes or good guys in their films and TV shows, but further on in their careers have now made a new life for themselves as villains. And they're really, really good at it. And everyone who grew up in the 2000s knows that Helena Bonham Carter had one hell of a villain sense. Sadly, her stiff performance here stopped me from growing an emotional attachment to Jane and it was hard to really feel the feels when she was executed. On the bright side, she and Carrie Elways had good chemistry, and I think this is the most developed Guildford Dudley you're ever going to see. It perpetuates the idea that Jane's parents were abusive, physically by her mother and emotionally by her father. As such, you at least side with Jane against them when she starts exercising her authority as queen. But one has to live with the fact that much of this is fictional, and sadly, what little happiness Jane and Guildford had in the film probably didn't happen in real life. You want to think that Jane and Guildford had a little affection towards each other, but the truth is they simply didn't have enough time or freedom to grow that love. Other than that, this is still a great movie and has one of the more historically accurate portrayals of Tudor fashions, stays and all. Tell me, why do you hate this Warwick with such violence? He said it was for the king's sake I should stay here. Yet I have not seen the king, not once. I'm afraid. I wake up at night with the sound of his name in my ears. My Lord Warwick, my Lord Warwick, my Lord Warwick! My Lord Warwick will speak with you, my lady. I think I like this film more than The Private Life of Henry VIII. For one reason, Private Life is a mostly light-hearted and humorous romp through Tudor history, with a few heavily dramatic moments thrown in. Tudor Rose is a drama first, with very few moments of happiness for the main characters. There is an ominous sense that all characters are doomed, especially the younger leads. This originates from a curse uttered by Henry VIII on his deathbed. Nova Pillbeam's Jane is less serious and more optimistic than previous Janes. She is eager to learn about the world and see it. Being a Plato fan, I'm sure she's taken to heart the belief that the soul is happier when they learn more. But in fact, the more she sees the world, the worse it gets for her. Thomas Seymour is the first to fall to Henry's curse. He is aware sooner than anyone else that Edward VI is ill and won't live long, so he takes Jane to court to make her a viable contender. Somerset, who is written to be more sinister and paranoid about his brother, has Thomas executed for trumped up charges. Then not long after, Somerset is executed by Warwick, who goes against Edward's wishes. Warwick, now Northumberland, decides to put Jane forward as heir and even forges Edward's signature when he won't agree to it. Jane tries to take matters into her own hands, and is more autonomous than we'd have her believe when she attempts to run away before she is married to Guildford and approaches Edward on Thomas Seymour's behalf. On the bright side, Guildford is more sympathetic in this. 
He and Jane meet before they realise who each other is, so he encourages her to wait and meet her betrothed, and she is relieved to know it's him. Much like in Lady Jane, these two had a chance at a happy life, and Guildford helped Jane come out of her shell a little before Edward died and she was made into a pawn. When she becomes queen, her reluctance is clear. She knows it's wrong, the people know it's wrong, but she at least wants to use her position to bring peace to the country. Although the ominousness from her entrance into the tower is clear that she is doomed. I love the way they film the gates closing as the shadow falls across her face. Jane and Guildford's relationship comes off as these two kids could have been happy together, but they didn't get the chance as Northumberland kept using them and ruined everything. The film is great at showing how powerless Jane was and how quick people are to use and abandon her. But she always tried to find some positivity. Even as she goes to her execution, she reflects on the happier moments of her life, almost as if saying, don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. Lady Matilda, my crown, please. Your Majesty, may I present Lady, um, oh, Lady Raleigh, um, from the, from the court of the Taj Mahal. Oh my god, I finally get to talk about a Doctor Who property on this channel. Anyone who has not seen my Pearl Harbor or Titanic videos yet, should know right away that I do count time travel media in my rankings list because they still count as an interpretation. The Sarah Jane Adventures was a spin-off of Doctor Who, focused around one of the Doctor's former and best companion, Sarah Jane Smith. And it was awesome. It was aimed primarily at younger audiences, so it was broadcast on CBBC. You know how you have PBS and PBS Kids? Well, we had CBBS, which was with my for like the really little kids and then for the older kids we had CBBC and then there were other people out there who watched CITV but I didn't know about them. Team CBBC! <laughs> I never watched Torchwood because I think it was on too late for me to watch it and I didn't really care but is it kind of like one of those things where maybe some episodes in seasons three and four would make sense if I watched Torchwood? Kind of like how some episodes of Buffy make sense when you've actually watched Angel? Either way, I did watch a lot of Doctor Who related stuff that was on CBBC, not just Sarah Jane Adventures. There were like TARDISodes and there was like a making of Doctor Who thing that the kids would interact with. And then there was like the Alien Files. Oh my God, the Alien Files. I was quite, quite the crazy Whovian up until about 2011, no 2012. Then we got to the season four finale of Doctor Who. That was like Avengers Endgame before Avengers Endgame was Avengers Endgame. Watching this episode for this list is the first time I've actually watched the Sarah Jane adventures since Elizabeth Sladen died back in 2011. Mostly because I didn't have the show on DVD and it's only recently shown up on BBC iPlayer for everyone to watch. But the other reason was, when Elizabeth Slayton died, I was crushed. I was so upset because I knew the show wasn't going to go on anymore and she was my favourite companion. The day after I found out, I wore black the entire day and it took me going to the cinema and watching Tom Hiddleston on a holiday in the Silly Isles in order to cheer myself up. The story of the Sarah Jane adventures is that Sarah Jane Smith is a journalist on the surface, but her real line of work is saving the world from alien encounters from the comfort of her own attic. In the first episode, she saves a boy who was created by an alien, and she adopts him as her son, Luke. Luke isn't in this episode because he went off to university at the start of season four, so don't worry about him, he's not important for this episode. Luke is just basically better Adric. There was also another character called Maria from the first season. She went off in season two, so don't worry about her either. She was kind of like better Rose, if that statement won't get me killed. The other two main characters are Clyde, who does the introduction at the start of every show. He is better Xander. He often acts as the muscle and the comic relief, but he has the social awareness to put two and two together faster than the other characters. He starts off as a troublemaker and thinks that he's condemned to living the life that all the teachers tell you is going to happen to you if you fail school. But it's through working with Sarah Jane and the others that he realises his true potential as an artist and a creator. And then there's Rani, who we'll be talking about predominantly through this section. She replaced Maria as the resident girl next door, who 
has to jump through hoops to hide aliens from her parents, but her parents are very nosy, especially her mother. She is better Clara. Also the show enough. Fuck off, Clara. Sometimes you get a bit of time travel in the show, but that's usually because one of the main antagonists, the trickster, keeps trying to move around the timeline surrounding Sarah Jane in order to stop her from saving the world and create chaos. And yes, a couple of times, the Doctor has shown up, both David Tennant and Matt Smith. Man, I hope Matt Smith isn't going to become a running gag in this list. And this show has the credit of being the last time Nicholas Courtney appeared on screen as Brigadier Sir Lethbridge Stewart. This episode, or rather two-part episode, was in season four. Sarah Jane, Clyde and Rani are drawn to an old antique shop where there has been some alien disturbances. Immediately upon entering, Rani picks up a music box before they meet the shopkeeper, who tasks them with retrieving items made from Chronostein, which has the power to change the past, including those pesky fixed points which crop up in the Who lore from time to time. I think the shopkeeper was meant to come back in the show and be revealed to be a Time Lord, because he carries all the hallmarks of one, because there are very few characters in the Who-niverse who have the ability to send people back and forth in time. But seeing as Elizabeth Sladen's death meant the end of the show, this story arc remained unfinished. Sarah Jane is sent back to a haunted house in the 19th century, while Clyde is sent to the 1940s to prevent a Nazi invasion. Rani is sent back to 1553 and is mistaken for the new lady-in-waiting to Lady Jane Grey on the final day of her reign. Did you say you were expecting me? Well, of course. It was the Queen's personal request that you came. Seriously? Is this Buckingham Palace? <laughs> It is the Tower of London, the Royal Chambers. Rani has only heard of Jane as being the Nine Days Queen, and has a light-hearted approach to being in this new situation. Rani still has the music box, and just gives it to Jane on a whim. I didn't realise it at the time when this first aired, but the music box wasn't a thing in the Tudor era. They came about in the 18th century, which is probably something you wouldn't know off the back of your head, because I didn't, but it's kind of cool. At the start of the episode, Rani said she always wanted a music box, but then just gives it to someone else without a second thought, to show her generous nature. Jane makes herself appear as a regal and charismatic queen, but it only takes a few minutes bonding with Rani for her to drop the facade and they talk to each other as equals. I should also point out that Rani is officially Lady Rani because she was a noble by an alien prince in a previous episode. The story is confined to the apartments of the Tower of London, so you never see what's happening outside. You don't meet Guildford or Northumberland, although Jane describes her husband very unfavourably. When Jane is deposed, another lady-in-waiting, Matilda, uses a dagger to try and kill Jane in order to make her a martyr to the Protestant cause. The dagger is made of Cronistein, and although Rani now has what she's looking for, she decides to stay to help Jane because she realises she needs a friend. And it's so sweet! Rani stays with Jane for a few more hours, talking to her and assuring her that when her death comes, she will be remembered and won't die in vain. When Mary's army arrives at the tower, Jane allows Rani to leave, and she returns to the present with the Cronistein dagger. Jane's maid thinks it's witchcraft, but Jane believes that Rani must have been an angel sent to give her comfort in her darkest moments. And when Rani gets back to the present, she still has her Tudor gown and keeps it. Then she looks up Jane on the internet, Giving her prior knowledge of Jane was one thing, but her time with her helped to reconcile the fact that Jane, at the end of the day, was just a teenage girl who was used, but she was brave to the end. And Rani realises she gave Jane that bravery. Oh, I love it. It's my favourite episode of the show. Well, that and the one with the Mona Lisa. <coughs> what do you mean, the Mona Lisa? As I'm in the line of succession, I think they thought that to be under Lady Catherine and Sir Thomas's care. My brother's children, my sister Mary and I are in the line of succession. It's a nonsense to talk of you. I meant legitimately in line. Because he has no children and you and your sister could be found illegitimate. What did you say? Some still say you're a bastard. I should strike you for thinking such a thing. What are you doing here in my home? I'm sorry. None of this was my idea. I wanted to stay with my family. I wanted- Who cares what you want? I'm not putting this so high because The Last of Us is so popular and Bella Ramsey is everyone's new sci-fi slash fantasy favourite. I put them at number one because I believe this was one of the best performances in Becoming Elizabeth, no matter how underutilised they were. I saw tons of potential here which merits a second chance before it's too late. Yes, I definitely believe Bella Ramsey should play Lady Jane Grey again. We need their execution scene, come on guys. 
they would so pull that off. And just to clarify here, because Bella Ramsey identifies with they them pronouns, I am just going to switch to they them pronouns to describe Jane as well, just so there's no confusion. Jane was meant to be a seed planted for a potential second season, because at the end of this season, Edward has completely abandoned his sisters and he is literally about to be manipulated by Northumberland into making Jane his heir. However, there is not going to be a season two of Becoming Elizabeth because the production was heavily impacted by Covid restrictions and there was also a lot of negative press surrounding the portrayal of Thomas Seymour. I can honestly understand how Covid restrictions can discourage people from continuing with something. I understand that. I was working in theatre when the Covid restrictions were still on. I should probably stop saying Covid restrictions. And it got to the point where we had to test before every show. And literally, we were like three days away from finishing, three days away from the get out. I got a false positive, meaning the lateral flow test was positive. So I go to an actual testing site to confirm it and then the next day it says oh no you, you're fine it's negative and I was like oh right they're like can I, can I come back and I was like oh no we've already worked out cover so it's probably best and I was like oh I was devastated and yeah it's really annoying you can have you can be as careful as possible you can wear the mask 24 7 but all it takes is that slim extra line and then like literally weeks later I had another false positive and I was already feeling ill anyway so I kicked myself off of that run. I think I actually just made myself ill worrying about getting Covid than actually catching Covid. <laughs> but I do wish they had continued the show because there were so many hidden gems in there. As much as I badmouthed it, it had its redeeming features. The problem was the show focused on the wrong people. Forget Elizabeth, forget Thomas Seymour, forget Catherine Parr. We need something that focuses on Jane, Edward and Mary. Bella Ramsey was heavily invested in this role, even filming their audition tape at the ruins of Bradgate Park where Jane lived, and I think that shows true dedication. While this Jane has the shyness and intelligence that we've seen from previous Janes, Ramsey's has a few extra personality traits where they are prone to speak their mind a lot and don't care about the false flattery around court, and Elizabeth isn't such a fan of this honesty. Sometimes they add a bit of wit towards it and tend to point out facts rather than lend an empathetic ear. The early episodes established that Jane and Elizabeth could have been friends, but their conflicting personalities and the involvement of Thomas Seymour really burned that bridge. This would help establish why Elizabeth doesn't side with Jane, despite them both being Protestant. Jane is absolutely at the mercy of their parents and English politics. They don't function well in front of crowds and often stay silent in moments of conflict because while they do have inner charisma, they lack the confidence to truly express themselves. While Frances Grey does not appear, we see her father as abusive towards Jane to the point where living with Thomas Seymour was far more favourable than being with their family. Jane has potential but needs to escape from under the thumb of their family which is something we might have seen had the nine days been able to go forward. All I'm saying is just pluck this version of Lady Jane Grey out of this series and put them in a new one centred on them. If Glenda Jackson and Keith Michelle can reprise their roles across multiple versions, I see no reason why Bella Ramsey shouldn't. Just don't let stars make it. I've had enough of stars. Like, seriously, they are headache inducing. Guilford Dudley is in this, but he barely interacts with Jane and they don't directly speak to each other. Jane sees him from a distance but is too shy to approach, so it takes Elizabeth recognising Robert Dudley for the two parties to meet. I think this might have implied that Jane thought Guilford was cute but never had the confidence to approach him. So maybe in the second season, the two of them would have fallen for each other, like in Lady Jane and Tudor Rose. I want to talk more on Jane and Guilford's relationship in the next video because it's a vague story, which is often written into a tragedy to emphasise Jane's sad life. I keep seeing what could have been, and I want Bella Ramsey back as Lady Jane Grey. They still look young enough, so I would be willing to wait until after The Last of Us. This series had so many gems that we weren't allowed to exploit, but the casting was mostly great and brought a whole new light to Jane, Mary and Edward. I have the same feelings toward the supporting cast in the 2008 Other Berlin Girl, where Kristen Scott Thomas, Mark Rylance, Eddie Redmayne, David Morrissey and Benedict Cumberbatch could have done their own version of A Man For All Seasons and it would have been far better than that film. Despite what little we saw, I think I can safely say that Bella Ramsey is my favourite Lady Jane Grey.
This list was a case of choosing which ones I preferred over others. There are so many missed chances, so many small glimpses when it comes to Jane. There are so few sources about her, and even fewer written in her own hand, that people tend to just assume she was the powerless victim and didn't have much of a personality, with a little bit of doomed romance thrown in. Perhaps the best way to adapt Jane is to make her a major player in a large story. Something along the lines of Tudors, with a bit of House of the Dragon, maybe? It's difficult for Jane to carry a whole story on her own. I know that, but that does not mean she has to be ignored. Right, if my microphone can behave, I would like to move on to the captions now. Yeah, just as I was about to start recording the conclusion, my microphone started going all staticky. That's why I've got camera in front of me here, and then I've got the I've got Audacity on the monitor behind so I can keep track of it because sometimes I'm just recording that and I can only see myself and then I watch it again later and it sounds all staticky and garbage. I don't know why it does that, it's something as to how it's plugged into the computer or something. Maybe the wire gets twisted, I don't know. Maybe it's just something to do with the microphone. Maybe, high, maybe more expensive microphones don't do this, but either way. Let's move on to the captions because it's the end of a rankings list and that is the tradition. So this time I was trying to think of it because I was filming this in front of the camera stuff as well as audible stuff because usually I'm in the middle of editing and then I find the screenshot and I'm like let's use this. So this is a screenshot of Lady Jane Grey talking to Rani Chandra in the Sarah Jane Adventures and they're just having a conversation so I said make up a conversation. What are they talking about? And you have delivered. So I might do some editing here, so if I stand if I'm over here I might be Rani, if I stand over here I might be Jane. When I told you to call me that, I wanted you to mean it. Mommy dearest, look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? Please don't go into a song, your highness. But I just like to be part of your I feel like a crab in a grotto. I've never been much of a Disney fan. What is Disney? You woke me up. For this? My friend telling me about her relationship dramas while I smile and nod, dissociating from the whole thing. Oh my god, there are so many times I've done that. I've literally just not paid attention at all. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I love ya tomorrow, you're always a day away. But, but Jane, you're being executed tomorrow. Oh. This next caption is the aria of everyone who's worked in retail. Jesus Christ, is this woman still talking? Yes, just pay for your stuff and leave. But on my, on my last shift as an usher, I was trying to close up the front, and this guy literally walked up steps and I thought he was a grandparent of one of the, the kids in the, in the show. So I was about to tell him, oh, you've got to go to stage door to collect your kid. What did he do? He just went on a long ramble about how he used to come to that theatre when he was little and I'm like look I know it means a lot to you but I don't care and it turned out he wasn't a grandparent he just happened to wander by and decided let's talk to this person I was like I'm trying to do my job I'm gonna get in trouble because it looks like I'm not gonna do anything and I think I left the sandwich board outside because of him I never wanted to be a queen now no one will remember me people will remember you I most certainly will when your mom keeps telling you the same old family drama over and over again. Yes, I mean, I don't want to say that too loudly because my mother is in the other room. Don't say that again. The girl I haven't seen since elementary school chatting me up like we're old friends and I'm just like, who dis? Yeah, I, I've, I've experienced that. There was, I think, my 18th birthday, my friend and I went to Pizza Hut and then as we were leaving Pizza Hut, we were going, we were like going past another bunch of restaurants and, and bars and then a girl I probably must have known from school recognised me and was like, oh my god! hi and then when you walked away I was like I have no idea who that was for the last time I am NOT Elizabeth Christ people can two princesses not have the same hair colour are you listening to me of course <laughs> when the teacher brags about you being a good kid but you're only your true self at home oh yeah yeah, we we I, we know what that's like. That's just sad. Well, I tried to be the good kid, but there were other teachers that were just horrid. You weren't trying to be good. You were just trying to get out of the get through the day with minimal disruption. 
But anyway, those are the captions. Hope you enjoyed them. Um, I might do some captions for Rain Season 2. At the moment I'm just writing the script for it. Spoiler alert, Kenna did nothing wrong. And that was the Lady Jane Grey rankings. I really hope you liked them. It's been a while since I did a rankings list and I really am looking forward to who we rank in the future. Of course I want to do Mary Queen of Scots before the year is out and that might come true. So if you like the video make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. I can always do with more subscribers, more support. And of course I've got a Patreon page for people who want to support the channel. You're not obliged to do it but you do get some benefits from being a patron such as getting your name in the credits like these wonderful people here. They're wonderful. Uh, also higher tiers you get access to scripts and access to early videos when I make when I make them and also you can get a shout out in the credits so thank you so much to Alison Cuff, Jill Minero, Larissa and Leslie Williams and of course all patrons regardless of pledge are welcome to come on the discord server I have made and find out sooner how my status of videos is going and talk to each other about what's to come. There have been no cat interruptions. I thought there were going to be cat interruptions. Maybe Alan was just like, I see that you're working. Um, I'm just going to go over here and sleep in my box. He loves his box under the radiator. He won't let me clean it. <laughs> I tried to get some of the, I tried to clean it once and he was just like, get out of my box. Yes. And I hope you are liking my eye makeup. I'm hoping to do like some future stuff like maybe some shorts where I just sort of like lip sync to some musicals. Dress in these sort of outfit personas that I made for the, the Six Wives and the other other wives. You haven't seen my Elizabeth of York one, I haven't thought of one yet, but it'd be cool. So I would prefer when this, when this is done, that we lived, well, sh shall we say as cousins, rather than as man and wife. So that's what you wish? It is. But I should perhaps myself make something clear. Shut up, Wesley. Can you change colour or are you always white? No, I can be anything. And is there a limit? I mean, how many times can you change? 507. Oh.